I can hear you great, and I think everybody else can too. Great, let's get started. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, we're delighted to have you be part of this call today and talk a little bit about, um, about ESSA and where that is going um, as we prepare uh, over the summer and get ready for this coming school year. I want to give you a little bit of background on School Improvement Network and uh, uh, the, uh, the work that we do and why we care so passionately about uh, personalized professional development and the role that that plays um, in your school and the work that we do so that you can kind of understand our perspective and why it's so important to us to be supportive in your uh, learning experience today and professional development experience and just understanding how the new elementary and secondary education act um, known as the Every Student Succeeds Act is going to um, impact you and your schools. And I know we have a range of leaders um, on the call today and um, we have as an organization and I personally have been working um, with national organizations over the last several weeks and in, um, including uh, meetings with uh, state uh, professional development and uh, state uh, Title I directors, Title II directors, um, to really to help uh, you know them in their professional development and training as they um, transition to ESSA over the next 12 to 18 months and ongoingly. And um, one of the things I wanted to just kind of share with you is um, in this call today is you know the the experiences we've we've been hearing and how that will impact you if you're whether you're a state leader but more importantly at a district and local leader and the, the level of autonomy that you'll begin to see in the work that you're doing that is a little different than past years working with 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 federal dollars and support so to to give you a little bit of fee, feel for who we are as an organization um, We've been spending about the last 25 years helping educators improve. Um, we're an organization founded by educators, classroom, uh, experienced classroom teachers uh, with a real passion for sharing best practices with other teachers and, um, and uh, have been growing this organization for the last 25 years with the last about five to eight years really delivering that through an online platform. And we work with over 25,000 schools, about a million educators. Uh, we're in all 50 states, and we even are in 18 countries now with our resources because so many nations, as you know, are beginning to be more competitive and hungry to, uh, to be prepared uh, just, uh, uh, just like we are here in the United States. We've moved from 1991 where we were doing uh, delivering videotapes of teachers providing classroom instruction to really growing um, our organization through 2016, you can see this timeline here, where we are have moved to uh, on-demand professional learning, uh, where teachers can get the supports they need that are individualized to who they're, you know, to each individual teacher and each need of each school, um, and focused on the individual individual teacher, individual student, and uh, and then moving into integrating that into a comprehensive system of support so that you can have the most exceptional uh, experience for your classes. And, and just like you, we believe that every educator can be effective and um, that every student can be successful and really getting to 100%. And we know that that's really, really a challenge um, you know, in so many schools today. Um, the work that we do is all evidence-based. We're going to spend some time talking about what that means and some of the definitions, um, and then you know some of the autonomy you'll have this um, in in the coming years to you know work with choosing evidence-based products and services and supports. Um, our goal is um, to increase student achievement. We do that. Um, we have we're able to um, through our our evidence-based uh, program and the research we have behind that. Uh, uh, there's a link below there to a report called Predictors of Success for Professional Development. And we can increase student achievement by 18 de percent, decrease dropout rates by 20, discipline issues by 33 percent, and increase college intention by 10 percent. All of that is really by ensuring educators have the kind of support they need to, uh, to really help students do 
do well. And I think the more supports and, and prepared teachers are, the fewer challenges they can have in the classroom and more opportunities to do true deeper learning and teaching and have deeper learning and teaching in the classroom. One of the things we also want to point out is that the world is changing. I think you all know this, that there's 3 million tech-related jobs in the U.S. that currently cannot be filled with an average pay of about $80,000 per year. That's a Pew 2015 research study, and, and we find that to be terribly concerning when we have so, so many people unemployed in this country and underprepared for those jobs. We feel like 53%, so, and also the Pew, same Pew study uh, told us that 53% of college graduates are unemployed or underemployed. And as you, many of you know, whether you're watching your high school graduates go on to college and college graduates go on, um, and whether they're your own children or children you followed over the years, we all know that there's a real challenge out there and we have to raise the bar to prepare for that economy. And when we talk about the fact that we have these un uh, Fifty-three percent of college graduates are unemployed or underemployed, but we also know the kids have smartphones and they have the technology. And I, I just had a child show me how to do about fourteen new things on my smartphone yesterday, who was twelve years old. And uh, uh, but we also, you know, spent some time on other topics. And he, you know, there are things that he didn't know just you know, basic topics about math and, and reading, and I thought, gee, you know, we've got to do something to make sure these kids are adequately prepared. So let's spend some time talking about ESSA. Um, the new things about ESSA, uh, many of you have heard a lot of this, but I'm going to review from the top what some of the definition, so some of the differences are in ESSA. A lot of the power is going to go back to the states. There's a lot uh, going on in Washington right now, grappling between the U.S. Department of Education and Congress's intention uh, with what will happen with ESSA. But the idea is that while there will still be state accountability plans, they'll be much more driven from the state and local level, as well as the fact that the U.S. Department of Education will have much less say in approving those plans or, or uh, really having a lot less leverage over what happens through those plans. So it's going to be up to the states, and this is something that, and local districts, uh, this is something that the states and, and districts have been asking for down to the school level. We've had a lot of parents and teachers asking for this over the last several years. Um, so this is a swing back from you know national high-level accountability and putting the accountability back into the hands of the schools. We're going to see a lot more control on decision making, and that includes establishing standards, assessments, and accountability plans. Uh, for states that adopted something like Common Core or College Ready Standards, um, many of you will all keep those standards. You may adjust them. You can do whatever you want. There's not going to be criteria from the U.S. Department of Education on how to use those standards. Uh, but the idea is that you have some sort of high level competitive standards that prepare, um, that you use to measure your students against to prepare them for high school graduation and uh, college and career planning. AYP goes away. Many of you know um, that that has been a real challenge. It was well intended, but uh, difficult to execute. Highly qualified teachers go away. We're very much focused now on highly effective teaching and supplemental services, which was the funding that supported taking Title I to go to after school programs. That goes away in many instances. However, uh, I think we do point out on a slide coming up on this call that uh, you certainly still may use your Title I dollars for supplemental tutoring services and other tutoring programs. But that is at the discretion of the school district and the school level. That is not a mandated requirement for low-performing schools. And the criteria for school improvement grants are going to change. Uh, the, concept, the, the, the label school improvement uh, grant schools, SIG schools, that goes away. However, we'll have a new, new label and names for them. A lot of us in Washington say, you know, this is it's it's same. It's same thing, but executed differently is an, another way to say it because so much is local decision making now uh, in terms of the criteria. You have to establish the criteria at the state level. We'll get into that in a little bit, but it's all going to be around uh, local decision making. 
on how to deal with the lowest performing, most challenging schools. Um, secretary authority is limited around waiver state or state plans. We've covered that. And there's going to be a lot more opportunity to consolidate funds and have a more flexible use of funds in terms of combining all the different title categorical funds. For the purposes of this call, many of you are thinking about that transition to personalized learning. You're thinking about how do we begin to incorporate technology into our schools and well, how do we ensure that every child learns? Because that responsibility, again, is going back to you. You cannot rely on a success story of just a third of your kids doing well, which is our national statistic, as you know, um, in reading and math, that we need to count every kid. And we have so much focused on personalized learning. Uh, personalized learning appears six times in the new ESSA. Uh, in Title I, it, uh, they definitely direct funding components of our personalized learning approach. Then we have Title IV, which is uh, 21st Century Schools. Part A, use of funds for the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grants. The Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grants uh, discuss the use of technology 76 times, digital learning 14 times. And the reason why we point that out is because it shows that it's a priority that provide that these uh, the, the intention of the new federal law is to direct resources towards personalizing learning to every student, meaning differentiated instruction, something that many of you have been have known how to do for since the beginning of your careers, going back many decades. However, differentiating, as you know, is difficult without the use of technology, collecting the data, getting response back to the students. Now with technology, we know how to do that. So the new law is really reflecting how that can look. One of the things that we see that is also signaling the direction towards personalizing everything for students is how the Title I funding uh, is described and um, how it's, uh, the use of Title I funding can be used. And uh, the accountability rep plans require a high use of data to rate the schools and to do measurements. There's a, a lot of mention of the use of data and again, we are now moving into this new era of being able to have much more information on every student's performance at our hands and the um, and uh, gathering data is much easier than it ever has been before. Um, and so we want to make sure that we are still measuring all subgroups, um, that we are using um, growth as an indicator through assessments, and that's more through formative assessments than uh, summative assessments, end of year assessments. I was just at a meeting at the National Press Club at lunch today and, and the entire conversation around it was uh, for innovation in schools and how do we work with the most challenging environments and it is all around ensuring using data in formative assessments will help us capture where children are not doing well and, and respond more quickly as in on the moment, real time and not waiting for end of year assessments. Um, High schools still must include graduation rates. Progress in achieving English language proficiency is huge because we have realized this is such an enormous challenge in our schools. It's been moved, uh, English uh, language proficiency is, has been largely all moved to Title I in terms of accountability plans. You need to have at least one valid, reliable, comparable, and statewide indicator that the state can choose with the input of districts and at least one non-cognitive indicator chosen by the state. There has been a huge push towards social and emotional learning. I think that's been a real clarion call from the states and districts that we have to grapple with this on how on qualitative information and how students are doing in that area and now we are be really beginning to ask for the capturing uh, of non-cognitive uh, progress. So the key elements of school turnaround, and obviously we covering this is going to, we're, we're looking at talking about this in about a 40 minute window, is school turnaround requirements are now focused on two categories. One is comprehensive interventions, the other is targeted in interventions. Comprehensive interventions are the lowest 5% of schools 
uh, uh, required to have state determined interventions utilizing 7% of state's Title I funding. And what that means is that just like in during the SIG grants, the state needs to establish criteria for identifying where they will have those comprehensive interventions, who qualifies for that lowest 5% of performance. And then once the state uh, determines that, those school, the state can now, I think it was before, I know it was before, it was 5% of uh, Title I funds, now they can use up to 7% of Title I funding to support those comprehensive interventions. Also, those interventions are determined by the state. They are no longer uh, coming out of the SIG criteria that was part of the, of the um, actually SIG, as you know, was not part of No Child Left Behind. It was part of the waivers and uh, race to the top resources. Um, but so the, a lot of that criteria for school turnaround was uh, um, is no longer uh, uh, the framework in which will work. Uh, that will be all at the local level, determined at the local level. Targeted interventions are for any subgroup consistently underperforming in any school. So you may have a high-performing school uh, in a district that is typically has a high group, you know, high high-performing group. But if you have any subgroup that is consistently underperforming, that um, they would be in the targeted intervention category. Another big change, and there's still a lot of work being done in terms of the process of how these dollars will fully work out, but schools may now use Title I funding for school-wide programs and not only just for Title I students. That used to be a, a real sort of process of, uh, for uh, you had to create a real case for using uh, dollars school-wide. In a Title I school, we've had a few Title I students where it was not a school-wide program, and now it is much easier. To, it's going to be much easier to use your Title I dollars, and we think that that's a real bonus for allowing for purchasing of technology training and software. So we want to spend a few minutes just focusing on where personalized and blended learning are, are uh, discussed in the new law. Uh, because, as you know, the last time this law was authorized was in 2001. It was before we really had a lot of technology in the schools and how to use it. And so 14 years later, 15 years later, we've figured out that it has to be a major part of the new law. And so a lot of in, in, emphasis in Title IV Part A is on the, uh, among, amongst many uses of the funds is the blended learning um, is blended learning use and use of technology. And they have an actual definition for blended learning, which is uh, a formal education program that leverages both technology-based and face-to-face -face instructional approaches. This language is directly pulled from the law that include el an element of online or digital learning combined with supervised learning and time, student-led learning in which the elements are connected to or provide an integrated learning experience and in which students are provided some control over their own pace, path, and time. The thing that's critical about understanding this is that blended learning, and we, will, uh, we won't spend a lot of time today on the differences, but the focus of blended learning is that use of technology, student agency, uh, students driving their own, their own path, Personalized learning is the idea that it is directed individually to the student. And we know so much now that all of our technology is allowing everything to be customized in all parts of our lives, and it's important that we begin to think about how we can do that in the teaching and teacher and student categories. So in Title IV, the Student Support and Academic Enrichment Grants, uh, that grant pool um, which has a number of uh, former e ESEA funds that have been uh, moved into Title IV. Uh, that, that grant, those funds will be granted to the states, and states may reserve up, for one, up to 1% for administration and then 4% for state activities that they want to do a statewide 
initiative in any of the following categories. And then the LEAs receive a subgrant based on Title I-A formula. So that is, and sorry about that typo, but LEAs do receive the monies through Title IV by formula, through Title I-A formula. So LEAs can break that pool of funding down in a 20-20-60 category. So the, there's 20% at least uh, can be spent on well-rounded educational opportunities that include student engagement programs, social emotional learning activities, arts and maker programs. That includes safe and drug-free schools. And the and at least 20% on safe and healthy students' activities similar to safe and drug-free schools, and then as much as 60% to support the effective use of technology, including blended learning programs for students and training for teachers. Of that 60%, no more than 15 can be spent on infrastructure. The other thing we want to point out, and there are a lot of supports that are becoming available for teachers in this category, are English language learners and the kind of supports that teachers need to ensure that uh, that they acquire English as a second language. The accountability provisions are in Title I. They need to have, there's a mandatory indicator within accountability plans to show that there are supports and success um, for English learners. There's a uh, uniform exit criteria now for English lear learners that would be established by the states. And there's also a major emphasis on professional development and allocating Title III resources for teachers to learn how to work with um, all students regardless of, uh, of language in the classroom. And uh, we just believe very strongly that the individualized support for students will help them gain competency and advance more rapidly and I think this is a big change because uh, teachers have been really calling for additional support to work with this category of students. So when do we get started? Uh, well, now is the planning time for this. ESEA waivers are in effect until August 1st, 2016. Uh, the request for waivers and consideration for waivers has long ended since December now. Uh, you will see that um, what this says, and this has definitely been confirmed, that you really are going to have almost a year of, um, again, of NCLB until ESEA really kicks in. We're going to walk through this right here. The new law is effective for competitive grants beginning October 1st, 2016, which is the new fiscal year, beginning October 1st with grant award timelines to be determined, but any new grant program will begin to be launched in October uh, with the award timelines working out somewhere around beginning July of 2017. Non-competitive formula grants, so the categorical grants, that distribution um, for, or the, the new law for non-competitive formal grants begins July 1st. However, the appropriations bill for current dollars was passed in in December of last year, that will go through the 2016-2017 school year and be administered in accordance with the old ESEA as, it's, as in effect on the day before the date of the enactment of ESSA. So you will essentially continue to operate under the old ESEA until this time next year, the end of June, end of the next school year, and then you will launch ESSA. And that gives time for the regulatory process, state accountability plans, your planning at the district and local level, and that will be an ongoing process. So everything is on the old system. Competitive grants like uh, uh, the teacher um, incentive fund grants, anything that is, uh, that is considered a competitive grant program that re is a part of the of the new ESSA will start um, uh, rolling out this fall, and you will actually have 
this little window beginning August 1st where your waiver systems go away and you have more flexibility for this coming year. So, for example, if SES tutoring was working for you in your school, you could actually continue doing that. If uh, there's a certain program on NCLB that, that, that or, or if you never, you're not from a non-waiver state, then you would just continue through the way you, way you are. And, and your states will sort of determine how to do that. I mean, it almost sounds like, you know, the, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, all bets are off and all rules are gone. But the idea is to trust that the states will do what they think is best. They just will have more flexibility and relief from, uh, from compliance and audits during that period. The last bullet here says new state accountability systems will take effect for the 2017-2018 school year as those accountability systems are put in place. So I want to get, dig in a little bit into the professional development elements of ESSA. And before we do that, I'm going to give you a little bit of background um, on some research and studies that have been ongoing um, nationally around professional development that really informed the decision making by Congress uh, on the direction of where they're going here. And so we want to give you a little bit of background as to the why and how. And much of you will nod your heads because when you look at these charts, you'll agree that current PD, uh, most teachers are not satisfied with their current PD systems. Uh, that was from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation study, the MET study. Uh, you can upload that. Uh, the most recent market research was December 5th, uh, 2015. And then the, the New Teacher Project also did a study, uh, their Mirage Project of 2015, that PD is a good use of my time, yes or no. You can see it right there, no, yes. And the tragic part of that for the, for the no's is that we put so much energy into that, whether you're a PD planner or where you are, it is frustrating to see that that has not done well. And that is one of the reasons why we're such big believers in getting PD right. Uh, we also have a, a little bit of a, a grid here that talks about uh, what, what kind of things that teachers uh, have the most satisfaction versus least, least satisfaction and professional learning communities have the least amount of satisfaction. Lesson observation teachers are much happier with um, when, uh, particularly when they're not tied to consequences, but when it's tied to some sort of support. Coaching works generally well over time, but we also have some negatives on, on coaching as well. And so I think the idea is that how do we improve on that and get into the redefinition of professional development going forward. So first of all, ESSA asks for Title II spending to be evidence-based. Uh, it appears 27 times in the new federal law. This is just one of our sort of ways of quantifying, you know, what what Congress is thinking and how many times it's mentioned. Um, Evidence-based means that um, that instructional uh, for a program or instructional practice that is evidence-based has gone through rigorous research and has demonstrated a record of success. And there is a reliable, trustworthy, and valid evidence to suggest the program is effective. The evidence. Supporting these practices or instructions should be scientifically based research. This is language out of the law. The one caveat on some of these things, excuse me, I'm going to go back to this, is that there is part in the law that a part of the law that talks about the state being able to also determine things that are evidence-based or what may be evidence-based. Uh, uh, that can support that that may not have the rigorous research behind it yet, which is a little bit of a window of wiggle room um, for those of us who really want rigor in how dollars are spent, um, knowing that there can be outcomes for especially for the most challenging categories of students who need these kinds of supports. The idea is to no longer have um, 
uh, programs that have been you know used over and over and over again and getting the same result as we all know that that's the definition of what is insanity things we do over and over again and expecting a different result so we really want to make sure that our resources and supports go to things that we know have proven to uh, change change outcomes and get gains in student achievement and performance so the term personalized professional development also comes up and this is really a result of a number of national organizations including school improvement networks push for this but it's really learning forward ASCD national organizations um, that are supporting personalized professional development um, the NEA AFT they want to see all these organizations I know including you all want to see uh, 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 PD and professional learning more aligned individually to the teacher the teams and how they're supporting the child in the classroom so we see this show up several times in the new law language and they want that personalized professional development to be evidence-based again uh, we want to make sure that um, it meets the educator specific need identifying um, through observation or feedback uh, that there can be a personalized plan for each teacher and that it uh, that there's another area which says provides teachers principals or other school leaders with ongoing differentiated targeted personalized support and feedback for improvement a lot of that based on observations and evaluations and that can be um, ongoing daily um, and throughout classroom practice we see a lot of examples where some of the highest performing classrooms now of students where students are really learning and getting a deeper learning experience the interventions with the teachers are ongoing daily and it's considered a positive team approach um, not to criticize um, but to support teachers in their practice and find ways to getting learning right one of the big things that we have um, that we are pointing out uh, is that not all types of PD are going now going to be allowed through ESSA and using Title I and Title II. The term professional development means activities that are not standalone one day or short term workshops. This language was put in there to really get away from the useless sit and get uh, drive by PD. All these terms that we've used um, over the time that we all know about uh, we are moving away from that um, this law is saying that when you use your title one and title two dollars it needs to be personalized that doesn't necessarily mean that a one-day workshop aligned to uh, uh, aligned to your personalized professional don't sort of say personalized professional development program is not allowed so it has to be affiliated or or part of a, um, a, a, a an ongoing continuum of learning for individual teachers so if you're getting to, you're using it to get teachers together to learn or about something that's part of their personalized experience that really is okay but one off one subject not necessarily aligned to any particular need is no longer going to be um, an allowable use of expenditure. And so just to carry on, this slide is basically saying what is the most common type of PETA today? And that is workshops. So we really are uh, trying to spend um, time thinking about creative ways of getting things focused getting programs focused on individual individual teachers instead of spending 20 hours per year on workshops and so that that is it that is the end of we thought we would cover again school improvement turnaround personalized learning for students understanding uh, uh, how title one title two in brief school turnaround English language acquisition, how that fits back into accountability plans of Title I, really understanding what um, Title II expenditures are going to be about, and then Title IV, how that uh, new program of, uh, of, of uh, grant 
dollars that will go directly to districts, how that breaks down for you to choose that use of funds. And, and, and I will say before we jump to questions, and I'm sorry, I did not stop to ask for questions along the way, um, but what I will say is that one of the biggest emphasis uh, the biggest emphasis that I have seen or heard in the last six weeks of being in uh, being fortunate enough to be part of conversations with state leaders is that there is heavy emphasis in helping them understand the need to engage district and school leaders, principals, teachers, and parents. Uh, and students for that matter, but having that level of participation in the accountability uh, planning process where everyone has input um, in setting goals and how to be measured against those goals and how to set a really high bar for your schools to ensure that every child uh, has an opportunity to be um, not only get a, a high quality education, but really have that opportunity to be successful in life. Um, so I'm going to end there, see where we are on questions. And David, maybe you can tell me a little bit, you know, if there are any questions coming out of that. And we'll just take a brief pause so you can think about it if you have a question. Sure. Right now we haven't received any questions, but uh, let's let's take a moment and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in. few questions coming in. Uh, okay. Let me just start out with the first one. This is from Gloria. She asks, how are states to decide proper indicators? Well, uh, that is a great question. So that um, that's really a question. So I'm, I guess I'd be really curious, Gloria, if you were at the state level or if you're at the local level. Um, determining product, uh, proper indicators is really going to be, um, there are, again, there's a framework <clears throat> for determining those indicators. Uh, we can go back up to that slide um, about what, and Gloria indicated what is to be included. Is at the state level. So determining those indicators, so for example, we know that it's academic achievement for all subgroups. We're still doing that. Growth is an indicator. So in terms of determining what growth looks like, that is going to be based on your own um, supports uh, through your, your teams there. High school graduation rates, that's pretty straightforward, except also determining how you're going to do, do mathematically figure out what those, how to determine those graduation rates, not unlike how you did it under NCLB. Again, English language proficiency, that is going to be something that you are going to want to work with ELL experts, whether at the state level or at the national level. There are a number of nonprofits now that are exceptional at helping establish indicators and what that can look like. Um, and then when we talk about another uh, statewide comparable indicator of your choice, one of them can be this non-cognitive indicator. And that's, that could be, um, that indicator could be student engagement. It could be um, student satisfaction with teachers, surveys. You can do a number of different things within that. But those are all things that you need to decide either based on things you've previously tried and that you want to develop more or through your own research and practice. Um, and there are also a number of outside organizations who can be incredibly supportive to you um, at your state level to help you uh, determine how to best establish those indicators for your state. Um, again, they may look or could look exactly like your indicators 
uh, for NCLB, except that you're going to add those um, the ELL and the uh, one valid, reliable, comparable statewide indicator, such as a non-cognitive um, indicator. So those would be additional to your current system. Oh, that's helpful. Uh, and she would be gathering. On, that's a process that you also determine at the state how how you how you uh, determine what your indicators are, and that would be something that's comprehensive between the state and your school board and your other key stakeholders at the state level. Another question that has come in from Brian, will any of the regulations change related to private schools accessing Title I funding? Well, let me get out my uh, silver ball here. Um, I would say that in terms of, I have not heard any kind of intentional changes of regulations around Title I. However, uh, that has the possibility of being changed through the regulatory process. And um, I can certainly take your name and find out uh, what the latest, that's a great question. We always get questions about uh, private schools. So um, because everything has been so high level and just focused on some of the larger um, issues around regulation, they haven't really gotten to the private school aspect yet. So the answer is my prediction would be no, but we don't really know. I don't really know what the independent private school system is doing in terms of um, lobbying for or against changes around the around regulations. So I'm happy to put my ear to the ground and get your get your contact information and get back to you. Yeah, kind of on the same vein, uh, will it be up to in fact talking about private schools, will it be up will it be left to the state uh, on what funding private schools receive? Uh, in terms of uh, federal funds flowing to private schools. Um, I don't know the answer to that question, if that devolves to the states or not. Let me find that out. Uh, one, one question related to, to individual PD. Uh, Odessa asks, could you give more clarity to define individual PD and give an example? Sure. So, um, so when we talk about individualized, uh, uh, personalized professional development, we are talking about uh, focusing on a teacher's specific need for something that is challenging to her or him in the classroom. So uh, let's say it's, uh, it could be around, um, uh, uh, diff you know, if it were in, say, the area of really understanding how to um, uh, do, um, do something in the area of, say, deeper learning and asking, um, Asking, uh, you know, like the, the the question of, you know, really understanding what wait time is, you know, during the question and answer period, and how how does that work, and what, you know, in in measuring what how that works, and then saying, you know, uh, uh, in, and it could be in little. We, we what we are looking at now is micro learning, which are small little bits of professional development. So something that is um, really focused on say, you know, asking a question and then waiting for the students to come up with an answer and respond, that is a mini, a mini bit of professional development. And let's say the teacher hasn't quite mastered th that yet, that concept, and the observer says, you know, you're not waiting long enough or, you're you know, you're answering the question too quickly or how you're posing the question 
isn't um, in a way that is open-ended questions that allow the students to respond properly. And then that, that, that response may then include uh, going and observing a classroom. So the, the personal PD part would be either going and observing a classroom where a teacher is getting that right by going live and doing that, or perhaps by watching a video feed that's something that school improvement provides is a an actual video of a high performing highly effective teacher demonstrating what that looks like so that you could go online and watch a three minute video that's specific to that and then go back practice it because that's part of it so it's 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 observe it's it's uh, uh, pra and then practice and then give feedback again and oftentimes the, uh, the response may include going back to the observer or the, the coach or master teacher and giving feedback to how that impacted the outcome of learning in the classroom. So it's a cycle of learning that, that makes the diff you know, that, that, that the teacher is demonstrating based on feedback from an observer. And it may include uh, both watching how somebody else does it better, learning and discovering how it works well for you, applying it, and then reflecting and going back uh, uh, and uh, sharing, sharing that with your observer. Great, let me see if any more questions have come in. Uh, that's all the questions we have right now. If anybody wants to take some time and ask any more questions, we'll be glad to answer those. Yes, and by the way, you all are really welcome to email us with questions that may come up later, or if uh, we have the message board open for you know another 10 minutes, if you want to just use the message board. If you give us contact information, if we don't have the answer right away, we can get back to you. While the last of the questions are coming in, I do have a quick poll that I'd like you uh, just to fill out. This way we can improve our webinars in the, in the copy in the uh, presentation. Uh, please let us know how this webinar went and if it met your expectations. And uh, you know, if you feel like it didn't meet your expectations, uh, just let us know in the questions feature what what you thought was missing or how uh, what content you wanted covered more, so we can address that. Uh, this presentation will be made available uh, shortly. I'll send each of you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and also a recording of the, the presentation itself. Uh, the recording of that email will come out tomorrow for you, and the presentation I'll try to get done shortly after completion of this webinar. Uh, one question uh, coming from Gloria asks, would online free university courses, TED Talks, and the like fit in the definition of individual PD? Uh, the answer is yes, always. Uh, it's a matter of having it curated, right? So um, the answer is yes. It hasn't, those kinds of, um, uh, one of the things that we're working on between uh, micro-credential credits and then regular CEU credits for participating in school improvement network training is that um, is that you know those kinds of things still haven't been linked to any kind of CEU credit training. However, they really do pose as excellent resources for teachers, and I think that 
the idea, whether it's through the Innovate Learn Pro the Innovate platform, the school improvement offers where we upload all kinds of video, not just our own video of teacher excellent teachers demonstrating practice. We have over three thousand videos um, of short two, three, six, eight minute videos of teachers doing excellent practice, but we have a lot of open educational resource videos. I'm not quite familiar. I know we've talked about TED Talks, but things like Khan Academy, TED Talks, all those things are excellent ways of personalized PD, and those are excellent examples um, for, for learning. I mean, as you know, Khan Academy for, and TED Talks have, are so broad and so diverse in what they offer. And um, if they apply to teaching practice specifically, you know, absolutely. I think the idea is that, you know, I guess to answer your question, though, is it, it needs to be part of an evidence-based format um, included in, in a larger practice, if that makes sense. It's a little bit of a circular answer, but... Well, I think that's good. I mean, uh, thank you very much, Christina. And thank you for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can email me when I email you. Uh, and that will have Christina's contact information for if you have any personal questions uh, you'd like sure. to Sure. And if good. Gloria or Brian or any of the others, you know, want to contact me directly and I can help put you in touch with additional resources and supports, I'm happy to do that. That's great. Well, again, thank you very much for all those attending. And this concludes our webinar. We are so glad that you could join us today. And again, this presentation, I will send it out to you shortly.